Good morning, everyone. In last class, we talked about totalitarianism, right? We talked about the three features of totalitarianism, and we used Italy and Germany as examples for the rise and growth of totalitarianism in Europe. So today, we're going to study another example, which was the rise and the growth of totalitarianism in Asia. That is militarism in Japan. So firstly, what is militarism? It is a belief that a strong military force should be maintained and used aggressively to promote national interests, and that the military should play a central role in society. So, what does it mean by military play a central role in society? I'm going to show you some photos to make you understand that how military can play as a central role in the society. So. You can see in this picture what happened is a lot of like students they instead of wearing their school uniforms they wear in the navy uniform right so these children they wear it in military uniform at a very early age to teach them to embrace militarism and to embrace war and also these children for example in this picture the child in the middle was holding a military flag of Japan right so the children and their childhood have been used as a technology to validate, to moralize, to humanize and naturalize the war, to make war like a very natural thing that should happen in every society. Military education had also become an important part of their school life. You can see in this picture, the students, they were learning to use all these like machine guns and different weaponries. So instead of PE lessons, it become like how to use these weapons lessons to prepare not only, you can see in this picture, they're all girls, right? Not only boys, also girls, teenage girls right to prepare for maybe the future war to train them as a part of a military life so this is a part of example to show you how military can play like a central role in a society this is just a part of it like as teenagers as children for the childhood at the time so of course there are like all other things like the whole focus of the whole society is on militarism this is the reason why we call it militarism Japan. One extreme case is the kamikaze. I'm going to play a video to let you know what is kamikaze. World War II. A desperate time when humans found new and more terrible ways of killing each other. Out of this desperation came the Japanese suicide bomber known as the Kamikaze. To the Kamikaze, bomb and bomber were one and the same. They were willing to guide their planes into targets in the name of the Emperor they were told they'd become gods. Now for the first time in all color, a look at the men who were willing to embrace death and the devastation and agony they caused. These are the kamikazes. In the final 10 months of World War II, the empire of the rising sun was in dire circumstances. As a last ditch weapon, Japanese admirals and generals directed over 2,500 men to forfeit their lives as part of organized suicide missions. The world remembers them today collectively as kamikazes. The toll of the kamikazes was terrible. Scores of Allied ships were sunk or damaged beyond repair. Many more were damaged badly enough to take them out of the war. Their name means divine wind. 
They were to blow back the invaders. The wind was strong, but did not prevail. So you can see under this kind of militarism ideologies, under this kind of like ideological indoctrination, people they put all things relate to the army, to the military, to the aggressions as the first priority, even more important than their than their lives, right? So that's the reason why these people actually they're willing to die for the country, they're willing to sacrifice themselves for the militarism country, for maybe the tunnel, right? So under this kind of ideology and system, who will be the real power under militarism? Showa Tenno or the general Hideki Tojo, do you think? Of course, it should be General Hideki Tojo, right? For Showa Tenno, he was the symbol of the state and the emperor of Japan. So yes, he's important. Like in the manual, in the military, the first rule is they need to serve and even sacrifice and devote themselves fully to the Tenno. Showa Tenno, all those Tennos in Japan are regarded as like the spiritual symbol of the country, of the state, even in nowadays, right? So on the other hand, Hideki Tojo was the army's leading political figure and a wartime leader of Japan's government. So he's more like the one who is really controlling the country and make decisions for the country. During the time, the Japanese military established almost complete control over the government of Japan. This is the reason why we have the militarism Japan, right? Because the whole country is under the control of the military government, right? So why did Japan has turned to a militarism country at this time? Remember last class when we talk about the reasons of the rise and growth of totalitarianism, we talk about two things, right? On one hand, it's a time when the country faced serious economic and social problems and the government, they were not able to solve it, right? And on the other hand, there's a strong leader who came to people's side and gained support from the majority of the people, right? So actually same case has happened in Japan. While after the Great Depression in 1930s, while we learned the Great Depression topic, actually we mentioned this map, right? It's a time when US was the major market for the products. So you can see Japan here, the textile industry has become very important for Japan for them to gain money from the US. But after, and remember this material, the economic situation in Japan during 1929 to 1931, the textile industry, e even for the agricultural industry, it also has faced a, like a very difficult time, right? So while the government was not able to help those people to solve these problems, Japan's democratic government they could not solve the economic problems. So therefore, when the militarists like Hideki Tojo with a strong image because they have all those military power, right? So when they wear in those uniforms, when they pull their guns, right? It seems like really strong. That is the reason why they gained wide support from the people. So the militarists organized a series of coups in attempts to overthrow the democratic government during the early 30s. And finally, they won over and become the ones who's controlling the government. So after they came into power, the third feature of totalitarian government that is expansionist policy, right? So for Japan, their aggressions were in China and also all different Pacific region. They made plans to invade firstly the northeast provinces of China and then the whole country as which has led to the second Sino-Japanese war and what they try to do is to build a Japanese empire, but of course not only in China, but in the Pacific region. For example, firstly in September, in September 1931, Shenyang incident, Japanese ships invade northeast provinces of China and they founded Manzhou Guo or Manchuria. Sometimes you call it Manchuria. Puyi from the former Qing dynasty became the puppet emperor. What does it mean by puppet emperor? That means He's, he's like the head figure 
he only has the name, like an honorable name, but he's not really like have the power as a real emperor, right? This is a puppet emperor. It's controlling by the Japanese government instead. And in January 1932, Japanese troops occupied Shanghai. And then they did not withdraw until Britain, the United States and France meditate between China and Japan. And also July in July 1937, Lugou incident, the double seventh incident, right? Japanese troops invaded Beijing or Beijing. China's war of resistance against Japan, which was last for eight years, broke out until 1945, right? The end of the Second World War. When these people, they found each other, of course, it's like a good chance for them to form an alliance, right? Alliance is a very important thing for them to have a strategic aggression, right? So in November 1937, Germany, Italy, and Japan, they formed a military alliance called the Berlin-Rome-Tokyo Axis. Actually, these three cities are, are all capitals of these countries, right? So you need to remember the name and also remember when did they form the Axis powers or the Berlin, Rome, Tokyo Axis. You need to remember the sequence of it because sometimes the MCs can be very tricky to just mix up the sequence so you maybe forget about the real sequence of these three cities, okay? This is a little hint for you. So, See you in next video.